can't say if it works. So I'll start out anyway by saying thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, this is a really interesting and important and I think ambitious <laughs> project. Uh, and uh, I'm not really an audiovisual person myself, but Esther has asked me to talk about uh, easy to read and plain language from a research perspective and perhaps also from a Swedish perspective. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, so my title is Easy to Read and Plain Language. Can we learn anything from linguistic research? Uh, I'm a linguist myself by training, so that's where I come from. And I thought I'll just start out from that perspective and say something about linguistics. Uh, we would usually define it as the study of human languages, uh, human language ability and linguistic communication. In reality, it usually turns out to be the study of language form, language meaning and language context. And interestingly, when, it, when we come to plain language or easy to read or accessible language or whatever you want to call it, uh, we tend to end up focusing a lot on language form. Not so much on the, con on the meaning, but yeah, some on the meaning, and also a little bit on the context. Uh, and I want to focus on what I have chosen to then call linguistic accessibility today. Uh, I would say that what we in this room want to do when it comes to language is probably to make language as accessible as possible for as many as possible. And you will note that I've put multimodal communication in brackets there. Uh, and the reason for that is when you come from a list linguistic background like me, uh, the research tend to focus on the words and the sentences and very little on the multimodal parts. Multimodal communication research on multimodal communication is increasing within linguistics, but we tend to get down, back down to the nitty-gritty little parts, words, grammar, etc., etc. <coughs> uh, so what could an accessible text be? Uh, and now you can notice that I've said, I said accessible language before, now I said accessible text, because that's very much what the Swedish context and research, once again, from a linguistic point of view, has focused on when it comes to accessible language. Uh, a problem with accessibility and language, and this was very clearly shown in, in the Begriplik text project, for example, is that we are all different. So what's accessible for me? is not necessarily accessible for Torbjörn or Esther or whoever. I happen to like detective stories. I know how they are built. Uh, I'm quite good at texts about swimming, skiing, sailing. Happen to like computer magazines. Uh, and then I'm a nerd. So I even think that grammar books are quite nice. <laughs> Maybe you don't. I don't understand why in that case, but still. Uh, what's not so accessible for me, on the other hand, is, for example, motor magazines, uh, texts about football and baseball. I'm afraid I'm a cliché. Uh, science fiction or physics books. And, I mean, if you start thinking about this, all of you will be able to think about texts that are easy to read for you, and texts that are not so easy to read for you. So, uh, and, and that, that's, that is troublesome for anyone who wants to create texts or content or whatever for a large group of people. What should we think about? And before getting into what research actually says about that, I just want to show you how two <coughs> very different readers uh, will, will um, 
approach the same text in two very different ways. And I'm afraid this is in Swedish. Uh, it's an eye-tracking recording, and I just didn't have any eye-tracking recordings on English-speaking texts. Uh, it's, it's a social science text, it comes from sociology, it's, it's used in the entrance test to Swedish universities, or not today I guess, but it, it was used once for that. Uh, it's about uh, dance and gender and youth, and you don't really need to understand the text, I think. So what I'm going to show you is how two very different readers approach this one. So you will see, uh, you will see two eye-tracking recordings, uh, one pink and one green, just to remember that they are different. And you will then see how their eyes kind of move across the text. And you will see little rings for those of you who are not used to eye-tracking recordings. And the bigger the ring is, the longer the eye stays on the word, right? So, and this, this is going to be the really interesting ex uh, experiment to see whether I will get this to work in the iPad, right? Here we go. Wow. Well, thank you. So what you see here is a reader that the typical reading researcher would call a topic structure. You don't really need to remember that. But, but the point is that you see that it's a very careful reader who takes his time, uh, who goes back, who stops on the long words, etc., etc. So when we see this eye recording, we may think that, okay, this is quite a difficult text. Right. Um, now let's see if I can move up a little bit. Uh, let's look at the next one. Try again. Look at this one. Even if you don't understand Swedish, you can see that they have very different approaches, and you can probably see that it's the same text. So, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you here or anything. But what my point is really just what I said before that it's not easy to to create something that's easy for everyone. It's um, but still that's what we want to do, right? So we're back to. What is an accessible text, then? Uh, and all around the world, we talk about plain language and easy readers. Uh, it's not always clear what's the difference between plain language or easy readers. And some, some countries, as far as I know, only speak about plain language, uh, whereas others have both. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did have a look at definitions of these, and they tend to be different all over the world. So I'm going to give you the definitions we use in Sweden, just to give you my background. Uh, this is the international one first. Uh, the, play, the International Plain Language Federation says that a communication is in plain language if its wording, structure, and design are so clear that the intended audience can find what they need, understand, what they find and use that information. That's different from the Swedish one. Uh, plain language in Sweden is usually only used about written texts created by the authorities. And it states that uh, the language of public administration is simple, comprehensible, and cultivated. Well, sorry, cultivated, simple, and comprehensible. Uh, we never define what cultivated language is, interestingly. Uh, we do tend to, culti to, to define simple and comprehensible, though. Uh, and this is from the Swedish Language Act. Uh, and the simple is really that it's just free from difficult words. And uh, comprehensible, though, it's more interesting because it's adapted to, level, to the level the reader could be expected to understand. 
and now I was wrong, right? Because it's also free from complex grammatical structures. And then, of course, we have, we have to ask again, but what is simple words? And what is simple grammatical structures or difficult ones? Easy readers, on the other hand. In Sweden, the history is that they, they have targeted different, uh, specific different groups. Uh, and they cover all kinds of written texts. And they also include layout, illustration, graphical design, etc. So they don't only talk about the words and sentences. And that's a difference. But still, uh, both of these typically tell writers to avoid long words, etc. Avoid abstract words. Avoid, uh, sorry, vary the sentence length. And this is interesting, very distinct sentence lengths to create rhythm. Uh, use active voice if possible and avoid nominalizations, which means rather say they approved, use the verb rather than the noun they gave their approval, for example. And that's what we say. And then, of course, my question as a researcher is, what well, is there any evidence for this? Is this a good way of doing it? To be honest, yeah, more or less, that's the short answer. Uh, it works reasonably well, uh, but uh, it's not really that simple. Um, one of the things is that plain language and easy readers tend to be criticized for being, um, what's, what's the word? Um, not very interesting, fun, etc., etc. Too plain, in a way. Uh, and stated by one of the Swedish easy to read authors, Anna Charlotte Ekenstein, she said that one of the most interesting parts of writing a, a book is to explore what happens when I add or delete a couple of words, which words will con contribute most in making the text exciting. And of course, that's a really important part too. If we, if we don't make texts that people want to read, it doesn't really matter, at least when it comes to fiction, I think, whether they are simple or not. But on the other hand, it doesn't really matter if they are exciting, if they are not accessible. So it's, it's a bit tricky, the whole thing. Uh, so is there then any research on what simple and comprehensible language is? Um, and my answer is yes and no. Uh, there is, at least in Sweden, and I think in many other countries, most of what we tell writers to do is based on some kind of research. The thing is, it's not necessarily research on readability. It's research on how the brain processes words and how the brain processes sentences. And of course that is relevant, but it's not the same as looking at it within text, within the context for the actual reader. And it hasn't had the aim of making texts better or simpler or more comprehensible or more accessible for readers. It has only had the aim to understand the cognition of words and sentences. Uh, for some of us in this room anyway, it's a problem that it's mostly based on English and languages are different and of course that means that rules could be different. Uh, it hasn't focused at all on people with reading <coughs> difficulties uh, and unfortunately its focus is simple rather than comprehensible, which means it's focused, as I said, on the words and the sentences but not on how do we adapt to the reader. So we need much more research on how to adapt text to the reader. Uh, very short, uh, what, has been, what have been defined as simple words and do we know anything about it? Yes, we know that shorter words are generally easier and this easier usually means quicker because that's what we can measure. Is it, is it quicker to read something? Then we think that it's also easier. 
Uh, so short words, yes, easier to read than longer words in general. High frequent, yes, easier to read than low frequent. Uh, so cat is easier to read than cucumber. But the question is, is kernel easier to read than cucumber? Probably not. It's shorter on the one hand, but it's definitely more low frequent. And these two interact with each other. And then, of course, familiar words are the easiest to read. So I did my undergraduates in computational linguistics. And to me, computational linguistics is a still a high frequent word. Maybe not for all of you, once again. Uh, and funnily enough, age of acquisition. The earlier we learn a word, uh, the easier it is to read. And that means, of course, that words that were maybe frequent and learned earlier for an elderly person may be very easy to read for them, but not for a young person who maybe have, has heard this word once or read it once in a text written by their grandmother or whatever. So there are many things that actually influence our reading of words. Uh, Esther, I don't have a clue of how, how long I've been talking. Sorry about that. Good. Uh, and when it comes to sentences, uh, what, do we know anything about simple sentences then? Well, once again, yes, we do. We don't want to write too complex sentences with too many embeddings. That's actually the one um, uh, most um, valid, I think, result of all the results when it comes to language research. Uh, passive voice, uh, that's a tricky one. We usually say that active voice is easier to read than passive voice. And it is, if we just take this, the same two sentences, Bill was hit by Bob, or Bob hit Bill. The, late, the latter of those two, Bob hit Bill, is easier to understand. But if we put them in a context, that may be different. I'm going to show you an example in a, in a moment. Nominalization. I said propose and proposal before. Uh, once again, if we just look at those two, yes, propose is easier in a sentence that, than proposal if we manage to make some kind of um, corresponding sentences there. But when we put them in a context, once again, this is more or less ruled out. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Uh, I can't see. I can't see what's in my next picture. So I'm going to guess. Yes. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to the passive voice, uh, a picture can change the whole rule. So here, what you see is a group of friends who are leaving another friend who they don't think is a friend at the moment, the frog, behind. And in active voice, we'd say, the friends left the frog behind. Fine, that's easy to read. Passive voice, the frog was left behind by his friends. He's missing there. Uh, is if we didn't have the picture, uh, harder to read. But when the frog is highlighted in the picture, it's actually the same, and it could in some cases even be better, because we want to highlight also in language, so starting by the frog is much better. So in this case, it's not necessarily better to use <coughs> active voice, and that's the kind of thing we haven't really done enough research on. So these are just you know some various ex uh, experiments that people have carried out but haven't really continued on and haven't put in a readability context. The same goes with already given information. Once again, we change the rules. So the committee proposed a new sports center is easier to read than the committee made a proposal of a new sports center or whatever if we take, we take them out of context. But when we put them into context, the committee proposed a new sports center and we continue that we already know 
that there was a proposal. Then, suddenly, the, nominal, the nominalized proposal works very well. So then, the proposal involved is not hard to read anymore. I'm fine with that. Thanks. So that was just a couple of examples of what kind of turns everything around when we put what we think we know about simple words and simple sentences into context. Uh, and remember, I, I'm starting from the Swedish plain language and easy to read uh, definitions and um, advice to authors. So I said that, okay, simple and comprehensible is what we usually talk about in the Swedish context. So that we have talked a little bit about now what was simple words and what happens when we put them in context. Now then, what about comprehensible? Uh, we know a couple of different things. We know that previous knowledge of text content is the most uh, effective uh, factor to influence the reading process. Previous knowledge rules out more or less everything else. Uh, we also know that different readers have different needs. Uh, the Begripli Text Project that some of you attended the workshop of yesterday once again, very nicely showed that it's not necessarily the case, for example, that people with dyslexia are different from people with aphasia, but rather that they found profiles across the groups. And one thing that we do know is, for example, that it's different between experts of an area, and this is very closely related to the previous knowledge, and novices. So if you are a novice, you like a text with a lot of cohesion, a lot of cohesive devices that helps you from sentence to sentence. Whereas, sorry, whereas for an expert, that could actually hinder the reading rather than the other way around. And of course, there are lots of experts also within people who need easy to read texts on different topics. But we don't know if this holds for everyone. But anyway. Uh, of course, pictures should support the text. You are the audiovisual people. I shouldn't stop saying anything about that. And layout and structure, of course, can influence the reading. We heard that from all the Begrimpli text participants. I'm not going to talk about that at all. But I want to finish off by showing you something that has to do with uh, previous knowledge. Because I think that we need to think about both uh, how can we help people activate previous knowledge, but also can we kind of create previous knowledge, if you see what I mean, for people when we are creating text? Can we give them a good enough introduction to then have previous knowledge? And this is an old linguistic experiment from the 70s, and I'm going to show you a text, uh, and I want you to take 30 seconds, because I think that's all I have, to think about what kind of context is this? Where is the author, or where are you when you read this? No, oh, I'm sorry about that. I, I really haven't started the proper... No, that's better, isn't it? So that's what I should have done from the beginning. Anyway, have a look at that text and think about where you are. or where the author is. Okay, I'm not going to ask you. I'm, I'm just going to ask you to think about how long did it take for you who, who found out that you were in the supermarket to find out. And if I tell you that this is a supermarket, or I just put the title on, how much easier is it to understand the text, even if it's an old one from the 70s? We haven't changed the word. We haven't changed the sentence. We have just activated some previous knowledge. And I think 
this is one of the important aspects of what we are working with. There's lots of research on the word level and on the sentence level, and that's of course important to do, and it's not wrong. But we also need to put it in context. So I think that linguistic research can definitely contribute, and it has contributed by telling us a lot about words and sentences. But we also need to change and uh, develop and go further. Uh, and I th also think that maybe it's time that linguistic research on this interacted with other areas of research. Uh, because with all the multimodality, all the digitization, uh, everything that's happening at the moment with creating information is changing everything. But I still think that we can contribute somewhat. Thank you.